Now, how do we get vitamin K or how do we produce it? Normally, we produce it in our gut, the bacteria in our gut, or we eat green leafy vegetables. Vitamin K is stored in the liver. If your liver is not working properly, or if you do not have bacteria in your gut, you'll be vitamin K deficient. Vitamin K over here is activated by an enzyme called hypoxide oxidase. Welcome to the Serenade School Prep Academy podcast, your go-to source for insights and guidance on your journey to becoming a CRNA. In today's episode, we have the privilege of welcoming Dr. Stephanie Woodruff from Ursuline College with Somnia Nurse Anesthesia Program, where she serves as the program director. Dr. Woodruff graduated from Georgetown University in 1994 with a bachelor's in nursing, and in 1998, she received her master's in nursing from the University of Pennsylvania and was certified as a nurse practitioner in women's health care. Dr. Woodruff became a certified registered nurse anesthetist in 2008 after graduating with her second master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. In 2017, she received her DNP from Wilmington University. She also serves as a state peer advisor for Pennsylvania through the AANA and is a member of the Pennsylvania Association of Nurse Anesthetists Wellness Committee, and she also continues to practice clinically. Today, Dr. Woodruff will be diving into an essential topic that can be very hard to master, the clotting cascade. I know the clotting cascade, but this complex system plays a critical role in how our bodies control bleeding and heal after injury. So get ready to uncover the layers of this intricate process with Dr. Woodruff's expert guidance. Whether you're a nursing student just starting your journey or a seasoned nurse anesthesia resident, brushing up on your knowledge, this episode is packed with valuable insights you won't wanna miss. So let's go ahead and get started. Hello. My name is Dr. Stephanie Woodruff, and I am the program director at Ursuline College with SNAP, based out of Pepper Pike, Ohio. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about the coagulation cascade. This is a very complex subject that I'm gonna make very simple. And this is how it was taught to me. The coagulation cascade is a very important topic to understand how the body clots, but it's also on your boards. Let's say you cut your hand on an apple. It definitely hurts. You are bleeding, you grab a towel, and two minutes later, you stop bleeding. How did that happen? There's an entire coagulation cascade going on in your blood vessels that is protecting you from bleeding to death. So here is a simple way to understand the coagulation cascade. Before I begin, I must give credit to my professors who taught me this. This is a brilliant way to memorize the coagulation cascade. Now I want you to get a piece of paper out and I want you to write down number 12 all the way to the left and then number one. All the numbers climb down the ladder. Now write number 10 in the middle and put a star around it. This is factor 10. This is where the party is. Everything is connected to factor 10. Okay, now write down 11 next to 12. And then you skip to nine. I know this is odd, but you already wrote down number 10. You switch the two in your brain, it'll make more sense. Now, what is between factors nine and 10? You guessed it, number eight. So let's count down 12, 11, 10, nine, eight. Put factor two between 10 and one, then add factor five up the top. If you practice this sequence, over and over and over again, it will stick in your head. Now write seven below 10 and draw a little cloud right here. You draw a little circle around nine, seven, 10, and two. This will make more sense in the next slides. Do you remember the cloud you drew around nine, 10, two, and seven? Now I want you to draw a gun right here. This is the extrinsic pathway, nine, 10, seven, and two. Now I want you to draw a line all the way across. This is the intrinsic pathway, 12, 11, nine, eight, 10, five, two, and one. 
Here's a tissue factor. Tissue factor must be activated to go to seven, which converts to factor 10, which converts to two, but requires five, and two is converted to one. So now, I think you understand which factors are intrinsic pathway, which is your cloud right here, nine, 10, two, and seven, and what is the intrinsic pathway all the way across 12, 11, nine, eight, 10, five, two, and one. You need factors eight to convert nine to 10. You need factor five to convert 10 to two. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the extrinsic pathway right now. So remember when we drew this gun for the extrinsic pathway, 9, 7, 10, and 2. Extrinsic pathway is connected to warfarin, that medication, W-A-R, warfarin. The extrinsic pathway is vitamin K dependent. Now, how do we get vitamin K or how do we produce it? Normally, we produce it in our gut, the bacteria in our gut, or we eat green leafy vegetables. Vitamin K is stored in the liver. If your liver is not working properly, or if you do not have bacteria in your gut, you'll be vitamin K deficient. Vitamin K over here is activated by an enzyme called hypoxide oxidase, which activates vitamin K, to which factors? 10, 9, 7, and 2. I put a 1 and a little 0 here because if you remember this, vitamin K was born in 1972. So if you put the 1 and the 0 together, it's 10, 9, 7, and 2. It's the same thing. So to prevent clotting of the blood, warfarin is prescribed. Warfarin over here prevents epoxide oxidase to activate vitamin K. And then vitamin K does not activate these factors, 10, 9, 7, and 2. If they are not activated, there is no clot. For example, Patients who have atrial fibrillation are put on warfarin to prevent clotting. Labs that are ordered to see if warfarin is working, P, T, I, and R. So if you remember, extrinsic pathway, warfarin, and P, T, I, and R. Now for intrinsic pathway to work, you need all of these factors. To block this pathway, heparin is prescribed. What is interesting is that heparin helps antithrombin down here to inhibit factors 12, 11, 9, and 10. To see if heparin is working, PTT is ordered. And if you put a little dash between the two T's, it becomes an H. This is very important because if a patient is in the hospital and has a DVT in the leg, they are put on heparin to prevent them from throwing a clot to the lungs, to the brain. So heparin is really important. Finding if heparin works, you order PTT. Finding if warfarin works, you order PTINR. Is it making more sense now? Hey Future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration from a CRNA School Prep Academy student. Thank you, thank you, thank you CRNA School Prep Academy. I have applied to Case Western four times and got rejected three times. Those rejections happened before I found CSBA. After my third rejection, I found an amazing mentor Haley through NTN's mock interview service who told me what I need to do over the next year. I'm someone who did not do well in nursing school at the beginning with a 2.7 GPA in undergrad and a 2.74 in RN school. I didn't know there would ever be any hope for me, but I worked my butt off to get a 3.8 in my RN to BSN, and I got my CCRN at the same time. I took some advising from the program director who recommended that I take advanced pathophysiology. I got an A in that course. I continued to precept, do charge nurse on my units, and participate in some sort of committee. When I decided to do travel nursing, I was concerned I'd be looked at different. 
My program director at this time said, while they take travelers, they found that travel nurses tend to take easier assignments than the program usually likes your candidates to take. I happen to be a charge nurse and preceptor on my current travel assignment. The director emphasized that I needed to mention this, which I did, because it put me apart from the other travelers. I also took my CSC this application year, which helped me study a lot sooner than I did in the past. I thought despite my efforts to consistently improve and prepare for my final interview at my top choice, my interview went poorly. I chose the first day, the first time slot, and I was more confident in my preparedness thanks to CSBA. Despite me not feeling the best, I wasn't going to give up. While working uh, Hurricane Ian in Florida, I got a decision letter. I was accepted. I'm still in disbelief that after four attempts and three rejections, I finally got in. I couldn't have done it without CSBA, Haley and the amazing mock interview mentors who have helped prepare me along the way. Use this service. It will make a difference. Thank you to all the Academy for helping me achieve what I thought was impossible. Endless thank yous. Dear future CRNA, I love this share and you know who you are. So congratulations. I'm so incredibly proud of you. And if you're listening to this story, I would love to be able to help you as well. Be sure to sign up for our free future CRNA newsletter just by clicking the link below in the show notes or comments. Cheers to your future. Now back to the show. I'm sure you're thinking by now, where do all these coagulation factors come from? All of the factors are produced in the liver, except for factors eight and von Willebrand's factor, VWF. Eight and von Willebrand factor are always together. They're married. So remember the first drawing we did. You need factor eight to convert nine and 10. You need factor five to convert from 10 to two. And then two activates one. So all of these factors are produced in the liver, except for factor eight and von Willebrand factor. Factor two is called prothrombin. Factor two is converted to factor 2A called thrombin. Factor two is converted to factor one, if you remember. Factor one is called fibrinogen, is converted into fibrin with the help of calcium. Fibrinogen is the primary hemostatic plug. And with the help of calcium, Fibrin is the secondary hemostatic plug. Fibrin is a stable clot, which is the ultimate goal. As you can see, the coagulation cascade is extremely important to the body. Now you understand the clotting cascade. Each time you cut yourself, you know exactly how the clot is formed. When your liver is not working properly, neither is the coagulation cascade. Thank you for watching my presentation on the coagulation cascade. I hope you enjoyed it and you understand it a little bit better. As I said previously, I am the program director at Ursuline College of Snap, and this is based out of Pepper Pike, Ohio. Ursuline College of Snap is a 36 month format that prepares a baccalaureate educated nurse to become a doctorally prepared nurse anesthesiologist. Classes will be asynchronous and synchronous for distance learning program. Students will be required to be on campus once a year throughout the three-year program for intensive skills, instruction, and competency assessments. This is a national program with clinical sites across the United States. Clinical starts in year two. Our applications are now open for the next cohort that starts in January of 2025. The application deadline is May 15th. Visit our website at snapcrna.com to register for more information or information sessions. Our next information session is Tuesday, March 12th. And as you can see, we have them at least twice a month up until May. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you for your time. Hey, future CRNA, as always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. 
I'd love to hear from you. So screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at Sierra School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to SierraNateSchoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your Sierra journey. Stay strong and I'll see you next week.